Welcome again to another Midweek Devotion, friends. Would you turn with me to today to Acts chapter 16? I'm going to read from verse 6. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. If, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. It had been five years since they got back from their first missionary journey and began on the second missionary journey. And this time, of course, Paul and Barnabas split up. And Paul took Silas and went one direction. And Barnabas teamed up with John Mark and they sailed from Antioch to Cyprus, where churches had been established on the island five years earlier, to strengthen them to see how they were going. So Paul and Silas set out on foot, out from Antioch, and they were gone for three years, from AD 49 to AD 52, and calculating the distance in those three years, they covered 3,000 miles, a massive distance for a first century journey. You may notice when I read these, uh, this passage to you, there's a great deal of movement noticed in our reading. A lot of movement coming and going. Some have said the Holy Spirit's not a pool, it's a river. And Paul and, Paul and Silas were certainly in the river of the Spirit. It's important for us to be open to the Spirit and be ready to move and do things as he guides us. You know, remember I read how they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. You know, if they'd gone to Asia, they'd have reached that massive city of Ephesus, the great pagan city to bring the gospel to. But they were, didn't go that way. They tried then to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus said, not that way. So they were hemmed in, passed by Mysia, and came down to the port of Troas. That's where the Spirit of Jesus wanted them, a seaport. You know, even apostles don't always get it right. But they are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, in this case, and so must we be. You know, it's a real assurance when you read the Scriptures. The Bible says in Proverbs 3.16, or three six, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That was happening to Paul and Silas, and no doubt it happens to us without us even realizing. Someone said we can't change the direction of the wind, but we can readjust our sails, and so often we may need to, like Paul and Silas did. Verse eight and nine. So they went down to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over and help us. A man from Macedonia. This man represents a huge population that's beyond their boundary. You know, we must never forget as Christians, we live in the age of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, and he did after he ascended. He sent us another comforter, Pentecost. And we have the same spirit that guided Paul and Silas then in us today. 
We might too have to exercise patience when we want to do something, but God says, not there, not there, not now, wrong time. This is the wrong direction, go here. And as someone said, the Holy Spirit is able to clear the fogs of uncertainty that so often come in our Christian lives. And I think that's worth remembering. He knows the way through the wilderness. All we have to do is follow, as the scripture says, the song says. So here was the man of Macedonia standing and begging. Come over. The word for standing and begging is three words in the English, but it's only one word in the Greek, parakelio, parakelio. Uh, it's a passionate call for help. And come over. It's another interesting word, really, used here, diabeno. It means cross over, go through. And it suggests it won't be easy, but you've got to do it. Um, it's used in Hebrews 11.29, where... The Israelites do, were talked about crossing the Red Sea. There's going to be barriers to be broken, but come on, come through. And that's what really this man of Macedonia was saying. Come over and help us. It won't be easy, but come over and help us. So verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. From Troas, we put out to sea, straight from Samothrace and next to Neapolis. Notice, without hesitation, immediately they were going. Someone has said, obedience must always follow a revelation of the Holy Spirit. And note here, the tense changes from they to the first, to the, from the third person, they, to the first person, us. We, we, we. It, what it means is that lo Luke would have joined them there, the man who wrote the gospel, the, the book, the gospel, gospel of Luke and, and the book of Acts. He, he, seems, he, he joins them here at this point and becomes an eyewitness of their, of their journeying. So the team increases to Paul, Silas, Timothy they picked up in Lystra, and now Luke has is, is arrived. And the next day, Neapolis. That's the modern Cavalla today but it happens to be the seaport of Philippi. It's a, it's a nine kilometre walk from Neapolis to Philippi. And that's where the Holy Spirit wanted him to be, in this city of Philippi. Um, Philippi has been described as a bit of rum planted in a foreign land. The reason for this, that is, that there, um, this city was first a Greek city with Greek culture and then when it was conquered by Rome Greek Roman culture sort of overlaid it so you had two levels of, of sort of gods to worship you had the Greek gods and their temples and also then comes Rome building their, their gods and their temples and uh, it, it really was a very very pagan place but this is where Holy Spirit wanted Paul and Silas it's great to be in the place where the Spirit of Jesus wants you to be. I've always felt that about Croydon for on and I. Philippi, Philippi. Now we know um, from history, from archaeologists, they estimate there are up to ten to fifteen thousand people in this city, and they were there was a Roman culture then, and it was full of retired veterans from the Roman armies with their families, and it was a military command centre. And also a great commercial centre, and built on the banks of a river, the Gangates. And also there's very, very rich farmlands all around to feed the population. But also, the historians say you could always judge the size of a place by how big the amphitheatre is. And it had a huge amphitheatre in Philippi. I've been to Philippi, I've seen all these ruins. It was a, it was a big place, very pagan, but it was a big place. Um, why were there no Jews there? Look at this. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer called a prasusha. A prasusha, a quiet spot for Jewish prayers and meetings enclosed by a fencing. Why was that? There was no synagogue in this huge city. Why? Because there weren't ten Jewish men in the city. You could only have a synagogue if there were ten men and there weren't ten men. Well, what happened to all these Jews in this city? Well, um, they'd all gone. 
You remember, it's just a year, about a year before this, Claudius had made an edict from Rome to say, all Jews out of Rome, I've had enough of these troublemakers. And they had to leave. Priscilla and Aquila came out of Italy and had to go, had to, and that's why they were found in Greece, in Corinth, later on in the book of Acts. That was his decree. We don't want these troublemaker Jews. Get rid of them. That was a terrible, a terrible edict because many of the Jews had lived in in, uh, in Rome for years, but they all had to go. So that was just the year before um, Paul and Silas arrive in Philippi, which was very much a Roman culture city. So there's no doubt the Jews got thrown out of there as well. They had to leave. It wasn't until five years later when Nero uh, became emperor and Claudius died, that that edict was withdrawn by Claudia, by Nero, and the Jews could go back again to Rome. So on the Sabbath we went outside the city gate, expecting to find a place of prayer, and they did, they found it, and it was right under a mountain, I, I've been to Philippi, it's just right under a mountain, it's a huge Acropolis mountain, towering above this river, but at the, where the river was, where these ten Jewish women were meeting, meeting to worship Jehovah, and pray and talk together about the Lord, this, this, they were surrounded, surrounded by many, many temples. But what was Paul's missionary strategy, as we see in the book of Acts? While Romans 1 6 makes it clear, and the whole of the book of Acts does, always to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. And in the book of Romans, he says it three times in chapter 1 at verse 16, and in chapter 2 at verse 9 and 10. He always wanted to give the the Jews the opportunity first to accept the gospel that they that generally was rejected by the Jews and who crucified Jesus. So they went to the Prashusa and they found these ten ladies. Verse 13, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. We began to speak to the women who gathered there. Wait a minute. It was a man of Macedonia and said, beg them, beg them to come, come and help us. And when they got there, there weren't any men, only women. No Jewish men. But we sat down. It must have been a big surprise for the women as these men descended on them uh, on the Sabbath. But what did they do? It says in scripture, we sat down and began to speak. We sat down. That's a surprising word, speak. We began to speak. Not preach, not shout at them. The Greek word is lalio. It doesn't mean preach or proclaim like a herald or a caruso. The Greek word is caruso, a herald. No, they simply held a conversation. They talked quietly to these women about our wonderful saviour. There's a massive strategy here, you know. They're on the edge, on the brink of a huge uh, area of, of land where so many thousands of people live beyond, just beyond this edge. They're touching the edge of Europe here. And uh, the Holy Spirit's battle plan to gain Europe for Jesus, a few women, three or four men, quiet conversations. That was D-Day for Paul and the Holy Spirit. I was thinking when we need to get back into Europe and pushed the Nazis out. It was massive. 6th of June 1944. 156,000 troops. A whole beach area 50 miles of heavily defended beaches by huge, huge guns and things. 7,000 ships. Goodness me. Massive, massive armies. 867 gliders came down. 24,000 uh, really uh, ships travel under these guns 5,000 men died on the first day of winning back Europe and by the time they got to Berlin and won hundreds of thousands of soldiers have been killed just to get Europe back free contrasts quite a bit doesn't it with um, the Holy Spirit's battle plan to win Europe for Jesus a few women quiet conversations a couple of men and they're going to, they did gain Europe incredibly amazing. Let me say, don't despise the day of small things. Your faith and life are attached to a great, unspeakably powerful God. Hallelujah. Verse 14. 
One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple, from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. Now, wait a minute. Thyatira is 500 miles from Philippi. She was a world-travelled woman. And it says <coughs> she was a worshipper of God, a Sabina Mini, a, a Sibamini, a Gentile who venerated Yahweh. Interestingly, only two women are mentioned in the Bible that identify with Thyatira. One is Lydia, this businesswoman, who opened her heart and her home to the Lord. And the other woman is Jezebel, in the Old Testament, a false prophet who led God's people astray. Well, <laughs> it's amazing. Thyatira. Um, I remember we went, we went on a, tour, a long tour, over 600 miles, on and I, uh, going to all the seven churches of the books of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And one of the cities we went to, of course, was Thyatira. Today it's called Axihar. And uh, we, we got there and um, we, we thought, well, we, this is where Lydia came from. Uh, let's have a sing song. And we started singing Christian choruses in the marketplace. Immediately the police came up. You cannot sing the songs here. Please move on. I found out afterwards that Turkey is one of the most unevangelized countries in Europe. But this is where Lydia had was born and lived and had a business and a house there, no doubt. Now notice Lydia is a Gentile name. Strangely enough, the reason she came from actually was called Lydia. And no doubt her parents were very, very Gentile. They, they loved where they lived and they gave their daughter the name Lydia. She must have learned a lot from her father because now she, historians tell her she was a, what you would call a purple merchant, a wealthy woman. Um, she was down um, and learnt a lot in Thyatira, which had been a great commercial centre. There were many trade guilds, we were told about those when we were there. But those trade gu guilds were sort of excuses for drunken orgies, orgies and worshipping foreign gods and all that. But she, she was uh, in the business of dyeing cloth, not only any cloth, but she had access to the most expensive dye in the world, the purple dye. Uh, that, that um, gave the, this wonderful colour that could only be produced from one source. And the source of the dye was, was shellfish harvested from the sea. And it took 8,000 shellfish to produce one gram of this amazing purple dye. So only it was a luxury market she was in. And only very, very wealthy people and royalty would be able to buy her product. And of course, she, she was trained in dying. She had secret vomits in her mind in, when she was in Thyatira. She was an expert merchant woman. She knew her business. Can I just say this? While she was deeply engrossed in business, she still had time for her soul. I remember what Henry Martin said, the great missionary to India and Persia. He died in 1812, so it's an old quote. But he said, Our first great business on earth is to align and attend to our souls. Wow. Are you looking after your soul as priority? You should be. When you get to my age, you will be. Uh, to put it in terms of book, a writer I like, Tommy Tenner, Tenney, he said, Lydia was a God chaser. Though she was Gentile, the idols, the idols of Thyatira, Apollo and Artemis and all that, did nothing for her. And uh, she had obviously, um, she had an, a heart, an emptiness in her heart she tried to fill. She was rich, she had well, at least two homes, she had servants, she had clients, some may well have been wealthy clients, royal clients. She was still empty. She searched Judaism. For somehow it appealed to a monotheistic religion uh, based on Yahweh, on, on, um, where she could meet people and have fellowship with them. That attracted her. But still there was this in her heart, still something missing. Cornelius was the same. As very, very similar to thoughts and life and search as, as Lydia was uh, in Caesarea, where he was. She found, this, this is the most, the most wonderful thing. What did, what, did Lydia, what did Lydia discover being among the Jewish people? Well, she discovered the Old Testament, the Tanakh. In other words, she discovered the law, the teaching, the instruction that she had found 
that would lead her as a schoolmaster to Christ. Hallelujah. So there was always this, already this preparation in her heart to be open to the gospel. The hunger she had that brought her into, into Judaism was that, that the hunger continued till it was satisfied in Jesus. I think that's very wonderful. Hallelujah. She found a God that was powerful but wanted to be close. A God that was amazing, creator, uh, uh, but, uh, but he wanted to be loved by his creation. She found that an amazing combination. And verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the message she was hearing. In the quietness, perhaps, of this riverside spot outside the city gate, she opened her heart. Or the Lord opened her heart. She had surgery on her heart. Opened her heart. Diagnoigo. It means to open thoroughly. When Jesus opened the scriptures to the two men on the road to him, it's the same Greek word. Diagnoigo. He opened thoroughly the word of God to just two men. That was the size of his congregation. And you remember when Jesus in the Diaconus uh, opened the ears of a deaf man, he said, he said, be opened. And he hit the same word. Diagnoigo. Be opened thoroughly. And he began to hear and speak. Friends, open hearts are the work of God. It's the miracle of being born again. You may have loved ones that don't know you, that know the Lord. Can I say to you, keep praying for the Lord to open their hearts. Keep praying for friends and family and children and loved ones and neighbours. Keep praying. God opens hearts. He'll hear your prayers. Verse 15. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. The word baptised there is, is baptizo. It means to immerse completely. The Hebrew word is mikvah, which in their case was ritual cleansing, dipping in mikvah bars. I've been in one, not with water in it, to see what it felt like in Jerusalem. Uh, but this is baptizo, to immerse in water. Uh, and uh, she, she was baptised and her house and her house they accepted the gospel as well that is amazing and actually where it says uh, members of a household were baptized the greek word there's oikos it means encompass both a family and slaves she might have had um, her indicates lydia was the unchallenged in charge of the home that she owned she owned the business she owned the property she was in people say well perhaps she was widowed i think she probably was widowed I don't think she was unmarried. I think she was. I think probably she inherited her father's business. I'm just saying. So I think it, the indication is that she, she, she was widowed. I think that. But in Bible words, the Spirit of God witnessed with her spirit that she was now definitely a child of God. That's what Paul says in Romans eight sixteen. The Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. The Greek word is sumaturis. It means to bear witness with. In other words, I think things say to myself, I'm saved, hallelujah. And the Spirit says, yes, you are. That's the work of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. That's Romans 1.16. Think for a moment about the courage shown immediately she was born again by Lydia in this city of Philippi. She was surrounded by paganism in the city and on the Acropolis mountain up the top, towering over the river she would be baptised in with her family. But, and she was a businesswoman, but not a thought. Oh, if I become one of those hounded Christians, maybe it might affect my business. I'd better be very careful. Perhaps I'd better be a secret disciple. Now I've got this new, this, I found Jesus. Perhaps, that, perhaps I should be lose all my money and all my business. She never thought like that. You know, interestingly, I did a bit of research when I was in that, when I came back from Philippi. Um, archaeologists have discovered, inscribed on a piece of an archway that led into the city of Philippi, a sign. And it said on this sign, no entry to unauthorised religions. Ah, oh. wow. An unauthorised religion well, we don't call it religion, we call it Christianity, I come that day into Philippi. But it did not deter Lydia. 
Notice her humble attitude to Paul. If you consider me a, a believer, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Come and stay at my house. You know, she persuaded us. The Greek word parabia, it means she pressed us beyond measure. In other words, look, I'm, I'm telling you, come now, come now. I'm not taking no for an answer. That's exactly what the Greek word means. I'm not taking no for an answer. If you consider me a, a believer, come to my house. And of course, um, there was real violence later in Philippi, as you know, reading on in chapter 16, chapter, chapter 17. This was, in their terms, a new religion. Because it wasn't long before a slave girl was delivered by, by Paul from a demon. The spirit left her. And the spirit leaving this slave girl meant the owners who owned her, they lost all the income they were getting from her. So they dragged Paul and Silas into the marketplace, which is a huge marketplace, I've been there, before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Trouble, trouble, trouble in Philippi. And that was violent trouble. Paul and Silas were stripped severely flogged it says and thrown into prison well we know the story after that he was thrown into prison there was an earthquake <laughs> and all their all the prisoners released and all their bonds were released and the the jailer was going to kill himself because that's that he had no choice but they don't kill yourself we're all here and of course you know that uh, so the jailer and his family they also became born again well where did they go after the collapse of the jail they went to Lydia's house and they encouraged the believers there. And Lydia said, oh, don't come your Christians out. No, we know, um, we do know, uh, from, we don't know much more about Lydia, but what we do know is this. Twelve years later, Paul wrote his letter to the Philippian church. Uh, it was around the AD 60, 61 when he wrote, he wrote to them. It was so right that the Spirit of God had hemmed them in, in to, to, to reach it to reach Philippi on the edge of Europe, in Europe really. And he says this to them, I thank my God every time I remember you, your partnership in the gospel from the first day, that's what we were talking about, until now. Then there were some final words in chapter 4 of Philippians, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, travelled south towards Thessalonica, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only, church in Philippi. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid. When I, I was in need again and again. What a church. You know, it is impossible to know this side of heaven how much Lydia did and those born again in that town that day. Lydia the purple merchant. We'd never know how much she did. But we'll know one day. It's all been recorded in heaven. She mentioned nowhere else in the New Testament. But I think, this is my belief, can't prove it. I believe she stayed in business as a merchant, purple merchant, cloth merchant. And she used the income to, pre to, 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 to pay for the gospel spread. Um, she, in other words, I could say she, she took Jesus into the marketplace. And she used her finance to spread the gospel, particularly in, in Greece. Paul mentions that in one of his epistles. I like what Spurgeon says about Lydia. Her heart was like a ploughed field, waiting for the seed to be sown. Then her life blossomed into great harvest of usefulness for the spread of the kingdom in people's lives and hearts and in other lands. Can I say, don't let unfavourable or hard circumstances determine your level of service to the Lord. Get in there. A walk in the footsteps of Lydia, following the direction of the Spirit. Hallelujah.